and reveal to us our sins and then cause us to repent of them. Forgive us our sins. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So this morning we are continuing our study in the book of Acts. And after today, we're going to take a break for a little bit. As Mike Sherritt will be here, he'll be leading us through a five-week series entitled God With Us. And it's kind of a launching pad as we go look at the next phase of where the Lord is leading us. Our text for today, though, I think is of critical importance for us, especially in the cultural context in which we find ourselves in. It's the, the first recorded persecution of the church. And it's been, it's been becoming pretty apparent that we are living in a time in which Christians have been and will be facing more and more opposition to the gospel. I hope after this morning we would all be made aware of and even expect opposition. I hope that we would also become better equipped to respond faithfully to it when it comes. So I'm going to ask the congregation to please stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 1 to 20, verse 22. Hear this, the very word of God. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, and Anas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man was, has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had, heard, had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. 
Thus ends the reading of God's holy, infallible, and inerrant word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Here we have an example of the kind of opposition the gospel of Jesus Christ will always bring. There will always be some kind of opposition. Therefore, you know, the temptation to compromise the gospel will always be there too. Here we read about verse 1 and 2. The priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees, they came upon them. This is not new for Peter and John. We read about it in Luke 20. Jesus, too, says he was teaching and preaching the gospel in the temple, and the chief priests, scribes, and the elders came upon him. In this occasion, they didn't have to they didn't have to, but then they put John and Peter in prison overnight. In verse 2, it says that they were greatly annoyed at the teaching and in the proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Some of your translations say greatly annoyed. Some of them say greatly disturbed. In verses 5 and 6, we read about how and ask the high priests and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and the rulers and the elders and the scribes, big group of people, powerful group of people, especially when it comes to the kind of influence they had. Why are they disturbed? Why are they annoyed? There was religious reasons, there was political reasons, there were some reasons regarding authority, the Sadducees, for instance, did not believe in the resurrection. And it's pretty clear, verse 2, that in both, and also in the, both sermons we've seen thus far of Peter, is that the core of the message has to do with the resurrection. And the political threat was there too. Notice the description of the captain of the temple. This was like the temple policeman. And imagine Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane, and then you have the ones that came to arrest the temple the guards. Then there was a matter of authority. Not only do we see in verse 13, they perceived that Peter and John were uneducated common men, which means they were just not brought up in the teaching, the training that somebody had to go through in order to become qualified. All these men who came upon them had trouble with the teaching itself but also with the fact that it was Peter and John who were teaching. I wonder what was going through the minds of Peter and John when this was happening? Like, what were they talking about that night when they were sitting in prison together? Maybe they were recalling what Jesus had said. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? He said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Maybe. Maybe they were recalling Jesus' warning. You see this in Mark chapter 13. Jesus said, Be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand, what you are to say, but whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Maybe they were thinking about that. From the moment of the incarnation, there existed opposition to what Jesus would bring. And since we're talking about the temple, go back to Christmas time, Luke chapter 2. 
Joseph and Mary brought Jesus when he was a baby to be presented at the temple. And there was a man whose name was Simeon. It says that he was a righteous and devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, it says. At that time, Simeon blessed the family and told Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. He's appointed for a sign that will be opposed. That kind of opposition that Peter and John are facing here is not new. The prophets experienced this. It was foretold. Jesus experienced this, of course, himself. The apostles experienced it, and guess what? We're called to experience it too. This is, week has caused me to look at myself and consider what I have done or not done in the face of opposition. And I suspect that's the case for all of us. There are some that may ask, isn't the gospel supposed to be a, a, a message uh, for all, a, a message of peace, a message of, of unity? I think it would serve us well to recall what Jesus said would be the result of his work. This is Luke chapter 12. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No. I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house there will be five divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Church, we, we bring a message of, of peace. Yes, peace with God. We bring a message of, of unity with him in suffering. We bring a message of unity, of eternal life with him where there will be no suffering. There will be those that clearly will reject that message. Opposition to that message will come. It's unfortunate that there are Christians, and I would fall into this temptation too from time to time, Christians who want to be concerned with how to make God acceptable to sinners. But that's not the way it works. God came down and gave himself up for sinners. It's more like we need to be made acceptable to him. And the way that that happens is by receiving the free grace and mercy that comes with Jesus Christ. What's kind of ironical about the whole situation with Peter and John here is that in the midst of all this, Luke puts it right in the middle of the story, verse 4, if 5,000 people who heard the word and believed. In the midst of all this, in the midst of the, of the opposition, and the difference between the priests, the rulers, the scribes, and the 5,000 who heard the word and believed was not religious status, social status, power, political affiliation, or financial means. The difference was that for 5,000 men that day, God did what he promised he would do through the prophet Ezekiel centuries before this. It was through Ezekiel that God promised to remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them new hearts of flesh. It was through Ezekiel, as we've been seeing in the book of Acts, that God says, I will put my spirit a new spirit within you. 5,000 sets of them bones were raised that day. It's 
temptation for us as Christians, too, is to villainize and even hate, committing murder in our hearts, hate unbelievers and those who persecute us. That's deeply sinful. Jesus told us to pray for those who persecute you. Here we are, people who have been, who were once dead in our trespasses and sins. God had mercy with us. He gave us new hearts. He put his spirit in us. We too were enemies of God. And now we're going to go around and hating, villainizing those who haven't received that mercy. When we know it's totally an act of God that causes somebody to be made alive in Christ. Shame on us. Then there's the fact that Peter and John have had some personal experience with members of the council. Does the names Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus ring any bells? These are documented pretty well in the Gospels. Nicodemus was, John 3, the ruler of the Jews. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man and specifically described, this is in Luke 23, as a member of the council. It would be these two men who became disciples of Jesus before he was crucified. And he would even help in the burial of Jesus. They too had received mercy. They too had received grace. It reminds me of Charles Spurgeon, <laughs> what he said about unbelievers, those who reject the gospel. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions. Let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. Which leads us to consider the way in which Peter responds to opposition. What we see from Peter is what I would like to call a humble bravado or a humble boldness. Now, I say those words, boldness and humility, humble boldness, you may think that's a contradiction. It's not. In fact, we get that example from the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus is described as a lion and a lamb. A lion who is strong and a lamb who is gentle. The word gentle and humble are used interchangeably when translating how Jesus describes his own heart. And let's just consider four aspects of this humble bravado. <laughs> In verse 7, they asked Peter and John, by what power, by what name did you do this? You do this. For starters, notice that in verse 9, he did not say, if we are being examined today concerning how we raised a crippled man, instead he said, if we are examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what, man, what, by what means this man had, has been healed, let it be known to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He never claims any of the credit. I once heard a pastor talking to a group of young men who were training for ministry. And it, it seems a little bit rash, and, and it's the reason why probably I remember it. But he said, there's three things, three temptations you're probably going to face, and I want you to remember these three things. Don't you ever touch the money... <laughs> Don't you ever touch the women, and don't you dare go near the glory. <laughs> Peter isn't touching the glory. He wants to let all the people of Israel know 
that it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's the first aspect of humble bravado. We, we need to make sure that we declare and we cannot be shy about the name of Jesus. It is the only name by which we can be effective and faithful witnesses. You know, it's no small thing that in the book of Acts, whenever you have somebody proclaiming the gospel in the name of Jesus, Luke inserts something that is very true. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Whenever you read the book of Acts, they're proclaiming, they're preaching, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Proclaim Jesus. Preach the gospel. The second aspect of this humble bravado comes right after. Continued in, in verse 10. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Without the resurrection, we get nothing. The Apostle Paul says it. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. The resurrection not only proves that everything essential about Christianity is true, in a world where unbelievers are left grasping at things that are fleeting, laying up treasures for themselves where moth and rust destroy and viruses and, and worldly leaders bring pain and shame. The resurrection is the reason why we can tell unbelievers, hey, look up. As Paul says, we have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. I love how Peter does this. He says, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this is talking about an illustration, by him, this man is standing before you well. Just like you see this man standing, God did that. He raised him from the dead. Then with, with all intimidation, they warned Peter and John to stop speaking in his name. So the third aspect of this humble boldness of Peter rests on the exclusivity of Jesus. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to listen to God, you must judge. For we cannot speak of what we we, can, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. This is a temptation and an argument, I think, is safe to say has been thrown at one point or another at all of us. I had a pastor who was once invited to a college campus for a debate. This is usually bad news. <laughs> The moment that he articulated that Jesus was the only way to God, it was only a couple moments later that he got jumped. How could you? That's so arrogant. After the debate was over, he came up to the person and he asked him, you know, do you think that a reason the person was an unbeliever? Do you think that a reasonable person can believe that Jesus is a way to God? The person looked at him and said, yeah, I think so. I would respect that. Okay. Well then, do you see how a reasonable person who believes that Jesus is a way to God comes across words like John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wouldn't it be arrogant for that person to say, no, Jesus, there's other ways. Is what we believe narrow? Yeah. In a sense, yeah. Is it exclusive? 
Yes, to all who repent and believe. Is it intolerant even? Well, in one sense, yes. Salvation can only come in the, in the name of Jesus. No other name. The last aspect of this humble boldness as we face opposition means resting on God's purposes despite opposition. And I would go as far as to say, like, resting on God's purposes through opposition. Here we have, for instance, 5,000 people who are saved through what just happened. I count the cost. That's a lot of people. Then Peter tells them, the stone you rejected, that stone has become the cornerstone. Reminds us that any kind of injustice that you or I will face will never begin to compare to the injustice Jesus endured. The man who knew no sin was crucified. And in one sense, we see how God decreed that to happen and that through those actions, he redeemed the world. So we see this reliance that we can have through God's purposes, in God's purposes through opposition. For us, as we, as we come across opposition, not becoming a martyr for the sake of becoming a martyr, we don't seek after martyrdom. But there is an interesting phenomenon about martyrdom. And the church fathers caught on to it really quick. They commented that the, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. You know, as we may face affliction, and, and we pray not, but as we may face opposition and we may go through periods of affliction because of it, there's something in that too. We should be reminded with, with any kind of affliction that we are, we are sharing in the sufferings of Jesus. This morning I was reading a report of a, a woman who was put in prison. She's, she's, she lives in China. She's put in prison. And she was released after several months, and they asked her, it's like, you know, how was it? And she was like, wonderful. What? I've never felt closer to God, she said. I think it was uh, Samuel Rutherford who once said, we are in the cell when we are in the cellar of affliction, we find God's choicest wines. Something about it. Or may we um, expect affliction, expect opposition. Whenever the gospel is proclaimed, there will be opposition. May we then be faithful in responding to it. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we do see this, we experience this to some degree or other. Sometimes it's in our homes. Sometimes it's with our extended families. 
the times it is in our workplaces and neighbors. Sometimes we, we give in to how easy it is to stay silent. We ask you, Father, that by your spirit of encouragement, that we would be quick to proclaim, talk about the goodness that comes with you, the mercy that comes with knowing you. We ask that you would also help us in times of opposition. Give us the words to speak. Fill us with your spirit. Help our unbelief in those times. Father, all of it for your glory. In your glory alone. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ.